A 240 Guto is the knife to rule them all. I'm gonna tell you why today. My name's Chris. I'm uh, one of the knife nerds here in Ottawa. I used to be a chef, did it for a long time. When I got out of culinary school, all I could afford was one knife. So I bought something about this size, 240 Guto. Today I'm gonna show you how I managed to get through the first couple of years of my career with one knife. A Guto is a chef's knife. Every chef will tell you that you need one good knife and it's gonna do most of what you need in the kitchen. So you don't always have to hold it back here like this. Sometimes you can hold it up here like this for little jobs. Today we're gonna to make a little pasta and do a little tomato concasse. When you're doing a tomato concasse, you gotta peel the tomatoes first. So what I'm doing is I'm using the tip of my knife to cut the cores out. And then you put a little X in the bottom. Then we're gonna blanch them. So pop them in some hot water to let, loosen up the skins before I chop them. Now I've also seen people do this holding the other end of the knife. I haven't done it too much, but you can use the heel for the same idea. Depend, just depends on what you're comfortable with. But I guess it depends on your tomatoes too, which way you're gonna go. The reason why you do the little X on the tomatoes is so that um, it gives you something to peel afterwards. It'll lift up a little bit and you'll, uh, you'll you know, get a firmer grasp on the, on the skin, be able to pull it right off. This one looks like a plum. So this is a Kurosaki Senko. So it's made out of a pretty fancy powdered steel. It's gonna be real sharp, stay sharp for a really long time. This guy's really well known for putting really kind of new fancy finishes on his knives. Really enjoying this one so far. If you wanna get a bit of a closer look at what I'm doing, I'm just, I'm holding the knife back, kind of setting the depth with my thumb. I just poke it in. The knife's sharp enough that I'm more or less just moving the tomato. I'm not really sawing around. I'm gonna blanch the tomatoes now. And the reason why we're doing that is we want to loosen the skins up. Blanching is one of those kind of ubiquitous culinary terms. It means you take a vegetable and you put it in some really hot water for a short period of time. Sometimes you do it to kind of partially cook something. In this case, we're doing it so we can peel the tomatoes. You'll also, you know, other things you might want to peel this way, like, you know, peaches and stone fruit, uh, anything that's got a bit of a delicate flesh. Then the cold water's there to stop it from cooking and becoming a pile of mush. Because nobody likes mush, that's why we have teeth, because you're supposed to use them. If you look, you can see how easy it is to get the skin off there. You can't really just grab your peeler out of the drawer and go for it. You kind of, you need a little bit of help. So, the hot water just lets it go. Just, I don't know, the skin lets go of the rest of it and comes right off. Like, you could leave this on. Like, if you didn't want to go this step and you don't mind having a little bit of extra texture in your food, you don't need to take the peels off. But, you know, one of the big things that you learn when you go to culinary school or you spend a lot of time in a restaurant is that it's all about this concept that we call mouthfeel, right? Like, how the food tastes in your mouth. How it feels in your mouth, not how it tastes. But it kind of changes your perception about what you're eating. That's why you always notice when you're you know, maybe you're eating like a chicken salad sandwich and someone didn't do such a good job of getting the bits out. You find that real fast and it ruins the sandwich for you, even though there's not really anything wrong with it. So yeah, the skins on the tomato, they can be, you know, they're, they're hard. They can be unpleasant, you know. They're hard for your knife to get through. They're hard for you to, hard for you to chew and let's just get rid of it. It's no good. So next step with this is we're going to cut these tomatoes in half, give them a little squeeze, get some of the guts out but this time I'm using a different part of the knife. So instead of before, I did everything with just the tip, right? I, I choked up on it and I was playing with the tomatoes, but now it's more of like a pretty straightforward kind of chop, you know? I'm still using near the end of the knife because I'm cutting smaller things. I find the bigger the thing you get, the farther back the knife you move. So I'm just kind of giving them a little squeeze, get some of the seeds out, kind of coming back to that idea of mouthfeel, right? Your tongue's gonna find a seed that got left behind. And it maybe bothers you, maybe it doesn't. But if you're real fancy, you don't want these in here. I'm not fancy, obviously, look at me. So next up, we're gonna chop these up and we're gonna kinda hang out on the cutting board a little bit. We're gonna rock the knife back and forth. We'll have achieved what we call tomato concasse. That's not something that you really need to know. Like, it's not something that's gonna come up at a party. Guto's perfect for doing tomato concasse. I always find like a guto is good for a couple of different reasons. You can like if you chop like this it's perfect it just kind of stays on the cutting board you rock it back and forth but even if you prefer to chop 
like that, you can still pull it off. It fits the bill for 99% of people. The only reason you might not want a, a Gutoza, you're afraid of a bigger knife, smarten up, give it a try. They make smaller ones too, but 240 is perfect for me. And I think a lot of people, because you can do almost anything with it, you know? You can, you saw me choke up on it and use it for really fine work. I'm doing some general chopping here. If I had to carve a roast or something, maybe portion out a big old strip loin when I was still in the kitchen, you could still pull that off. You know, it'll do anything. You just gotta practice, you gotta get used to it. Yeah, a lot of people, they get nervous about a big knife and I think it's because they're not holding it in the right spot. A lot of people come into the shops or, or I'm helping out like when I teach a class or something like that and they grab the knife back here but yeah obviously that's scary it's huge it's hard to hold on to but if you just choke up on the knife pinch the blade you know some people will call it like you know they'll call it a pinch grip they'll call there's all kinds of words for it I just call it how you hold the knife you know if you actually hold on to the knife properly you find you have a lot better control and it shaves off a fair bit of size like now it doesn't feel like a gigantic knife you just creep up on it, hold it, and now it's the size it's supposed to be. So, tomatoes, tomato concasse, all diced up. You can tell I'm a professional because I'm using a sour cream container to hold everything. Uh, next up, I think we're gonna uh, mince a shallot, some chili, and some garlic. So, we're gonna dice up some shallots here. Um, this is one of the things that everyone who watches uh, the videos, I seem to get called into the comments every time about how you dice an onion. And I'm gonna keep doing it my way. Take the top off little bit of the bottom, okay? You wanna keep the shallot more or less intact as you do this. Cut it in half. Again, notice I'm using the end of the knife, right? Small jobs require the end of the knife. Big jobs require the other end of the knife. Cut it in half, you peel it. No one tends to argue with me up to that point. This is where everyone gives me a hard time. You only wanna cut about 80% of the way through. All right, I'm cutting straight up and down using the tip of the knife. This knife is really sharp. Give me a brand new one. It's a good thing I didn't bring mine from home. Right? And this is the part. This is where everybody starts typing. I put a couple of cuts in there. I just know how, this is just how I know how to do it. All right? It, maybe it's the best way, maybe it's not. To be perfectly honest, I don't care what you think. Right? And then notice when I start rocking the knife, I come back to the center. Now, little pieces like that, I save them. They go in stocks. They go if I'm poaching something, a little court bouillon, something like that. I save the ends for that kind of stuff. I worked in a restaurant at one point. One of the older cooks had stopped me because I was trying to get every last little bit of the onion. And he said, that thing is worth about half a penny and your finger costs a lot more to fix. So we're gonna stop with with getting the little tiny bits. We just save them. You don't throw it away, it can still be used. Next up, I'm gonna mince some garlic. And this is another one of those ones where we get a lot of, get a lot of comments. Someone's gonna tell me I did this wrong. Someone's gonna tell me that I'm supposed to smash it. I'm not gonna do that, because I like my knife. Some, some people can pull it off, but this is a job for your hands. Now, this is yeah, mincing, right? We're less concerned about the size. Notice I'm still hanging out in the middle of the knife. I like to get it kind of small before I start doing the rock chopping. I got some pressure on the tip of the knife. I'm making sure I move the knife when it's up. You don't want to be too aggressive. You don't want to scrape it around and whatnot. I just kind of keep pushing it out. Every now and again, I'll wipe the knife off, push it in with my hand. If you find you're a knife scraper, you do a lot of that, flip your knife upside down. No one cares if the back gets dull. If you scrape your knife around, best case scenario is it goes dull real fast. Worst case scenario ooh, is you're gonna chip it. And you know what, the Queen of England's not coming over, so I'm done with that. Well, what have we got? More chopping. How spicy is this gonna be? Eh, probably not. Probably not too spicy. Kinda again, top and bottom. You've seen us do this, I'll use that piece over there. When you're cooking, all the heat's in these seeds. Watch, you can kinda Open it up like a little book, roll it out, get most of it out of the way. I'll come back after and trim the last little bit out. When you're dealing with longer things, like I find like a, a 240 Guto is perfect for most jobs because when you're chopping stuff, you want the food to hang out in the middle of your knife. Very few things that you're chopping are gonna be much bigger than the middle third of a 240 Guto. Uh, if it is, 
you're probably going to take a little bit of time and break it down into something smaller anyways. So a 240 is going to cover 99% of what you ever need to do. Rolling out past is not exactly the perfect job for a uh, 240 Guto, but I am going to use it to cut it up. So now we got this all rolled out. A lot of people are going to reach for, like you have the pasta roller, you're going to stick the noodles through, but uh, you can always use your knife to cut the pasta too. It kind of adds it a little bit more of a homey feeling. Uh, cut that guy in half. I'm cutting right on the counter here, so, you know, trying to be, trying to be gentle. You want lots of flour so things don't get too stuck together. I'm going to loosely roll this up and then it's like slicing a roast. And again, you know, we talked about it in the onions. If I'm not doing this the way your grandmother did it, tell somebody else. Next up, everything's nice and clean, right? We rolled out our pasta, we cut it up, used a knife, we didn't use the little machine. I don't know, different way of doing it, it's kind of fun. So first up, basil chiffonade. We're gonna pick off some leaves. Not, we're gonna try to not get all the stems in there. You get the odd one, it's okay, it tastes good. You know, I don't know how many people I'm feeding. You know what, we're gonna do a good enough job. We're gonna roll it up, get it relatively tight. Okay, but you don't want to crush it. And this is where a big sharp knife really makes a difference, slicing herbs. We're not going to bruise the herbs. You're not going to be left with a wet pile of green on your cutting board afterwards. But yeah, I really like to hang out in the middle of the knife, like I talked about before. The middle third of the knife does most of the work. You use the tip of the knife for the really fine stuff. Use the heel of the knife or the back third of the knife for all the whatever heavy duty things you're doing, but the middle third covers most of the ground for you. So I got a little bit of chiffonade basil. We're gonna just kind of scoop that up, move it over, get out of the way. Parmesan tastes really good. Also really good at messing up your knife. There's a good end and a bad end to this piece of cheese. This end, the rind, is the bad end. This end, the cheese, is the good end. If I stick my knife into the rind and twist it, I'm gonna break my knife and it's gonna be my fault, not the cheese's fault, because I know better. So what we're gonna do, I'm just gonna shave the cheese off. I'm just gonna, you know, hang out by the heel and just as thin as I can get it. You know, this isn't like a real culinary technique. I don't know. I'm kind of making this up as I go along. Kind of pretending the cheese is a pencil. I'm just trying to make it sharp. I like big pieces of cheese. I don't need it to melt right in or anything. Parmesan's delicious. Now, a good trick, if you do have a par the rind on there, you can cut that off and you can throw that in a tomato sauce. You can throw it in. If you had got enough of them, you can make a really good broth out of Parmesan. I think I got everything together. I'm gonna plunk the pasta in the water, saute up some veggies, mix it all up. Yeah, I threw a little bit of olive oil in the pan. The pan's not too hot. I don't know. I've never used this stove before. I might screw everything up. A little medium high heat. I got my shallots in there. Hope to God I don't burn this stuff. Bit of garlic, some of the chilies. And again, like when I diced the onion, when I made the pasta, I'm not calling this anything in particular. So please don't harass me too much about what I'm doing. For the record, I'm from the Maritimes. The fact that I got fresh pasta is a wonder. And let that go for just for a couple of seconds. Passed in the water. You got to make sure your water's at like an, at a proper boil. See that move? That was a swirl. Patented Lordy swirl right there. So that's not going to take very long. Now I can dump a bit of my tomato in here. These are really good tomatoes though. A little bit of pasta water. If you want to throw a little bit of pasta water in, because you're gonna get some of the starch out of the pasta and it's gonna thicken up your sauce. We don't have any cream or butter in the sauce. It's going to make it a little bit creamier. So. A little bit of basil. We got 
get some salt and pepper in here. Mm -hmm. It's fun cooking in someone else's kitchen. You make a mess and then go home. Quick treasure hunt. Oh. All right. If this was for me, I would just dump it in the bowl. But because I've got people watching me, I'm gonna do a little bit of the old the twirl. This is a lot of pasta. I thought I was gonna be able to eat all this. You know, you can, one of those. Whoop. So then, a little more basil for the top. Big pile of cheese. So there we have it. Some rendition of a fettuccine pomodoro. I did it all with the 240. You know, my opinion, it's obvious. 240 Guto is the knife to rule the kitchen. If you think you got a better idea, there's a knife you like more, please tell us in the comments. Uh, and if you want to see someone really do it the hard way, watch this video where Nathan makes an entire meal using just a vegetable peeler.